Well, 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 well. You're listening to Gloves Off with Professor Butron. All right then, I miss say words on point. Straight forward, no dream on job but everybody forward. Issues, facts and solution. Get it at gloves off with Professor Mutron. All right, what are the thing is a revolution. Get it on point with Professor Mutron. Gloves off, no nonsense issues. Politics, community, a better man for the reader. Gloves off, a revolutionary show. With everything that you need to know. With Professor Mutron. Watch ya! Gloves off is always on point. On point. Bringing you the best on current issues, community affairs, and the happenings around us. This segment of Gloves Off is brought to you by the best. So pay them a visit. Check them out. This is Gloves Off. For 30 years, Buitron Academy has produced great fighters, peace officers, firemen, and many great citizens of Laredo. We teach various martial arts, savat. Kempo. Capoeira. Each in their own traditions, trajectory, history, and pedagogy. Buitron Academy is the first school of savat in the United States. The first capoeira movement in Texas, the first Kempo school in Laredo. What will one expect to see at Buitron Academy? Respect. Fellowship. Coordination. Skill. And self-defense. Throne Academy is located at 220 West Hillside Road. Political paid advertisements do not reflect the political opinions of the program or its associates. Any political campaign or candidate who wishes to purchase advertising can do so. Advertising is open to all on behalf of Gloves Off.
back at you and gloves off. And today we have a great guest, our state representative, Mr. Tracy King. How are you doing? I'm fine, Paul. And you? Doing good. Doing good. Yeah, How's the campaign you. trail coming along? Well, it's going well. It's going well. I've been seeing lots of folks. I, in fact, I'm, I'm fighting a sore throat right now, so I apologize if, I, if I'm a little hard to hear sometimes. But uh, I'll be drinking some water to keep it. Keep it working better, but it's going well. I, you know, I campaign 365 days a year since we're up for election every two years, so I'm always campaigning. But uh, it's going well. I'm circling back around. Everybody out there that I'm visiting with, out in the communities, is telling me just keep on doing what I've been doing, and we ought to be fine. And so uh, we never take it for granted. But uh, that's what I'm hearing. This thing, just keep doing what you've been, what you always do for years, and and you'll be fine. It's it's interesting to hear what they what they say and I've been making the rounds. And uh, every two years, so that must be a little bit hard on family and hard on you and hard on everybody else. And How do they take it? Well, obviously I, you have to have a supportive family. Sure. And, and they get engaged uh, each and every time that we have an opponent. They're engaged and a lot of my, book, my wife is very active in our campaigns. Um, She'll, she does block walking whenever we do block walking, and we always block walk. Um, she's very active in that, but she does a lot of stuff behind the scenes. Uh, clips the newspapers and, and points out folks that we need to congratulate for different achievements that they've done. And, and then, uh, of course, I'm always out there, and people say, well, you walk blocks. And I say, well, every time I go, if, if I'm going over to get something to drink at a restaurant, well, I'll visit with those people and visit with the people at the tables, and then I'll go to the business next door, and then the business next door to that. While I'm there, I'll make the four corner theory like we used to do when we were in sales all the time. The fact is that Dilly, Texas is a place that I'm in a lot uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, I have some friends there, and then number two, I come that way a lot of times when I come to Laredo, and so I was thinking the other day in Dilly, Texas, I've been to the I've been to three different or several different groundbreakings and ribbon cuttings for school projects, and then at the, at the I was at the groundbreaking and the ribbon cutting for the new city hall there recently, and then there's been a dozen different times when I stop in the restaurants there and visit with people in there again, go to the gas station next door, the convenience store, visit with people at the Dairy Queen and ask them what's going on, and in my little mini town hall meetings that I do all over the district. Absolutely. I was going to say, what's the consensus in our area, in your district, mm -hmm. about our needs and concerns of the people and what is it, jobs, is it transportation? What's, what's the main focus on individuals out there? Well, over the years, routinely, the issues don't change. In fact, when you read newspaper clippings from 100 years ago, it was the same issues. But in our part of the world, at least, a lot of it revolves around the availability of money for different for different uh, programs. And in our part of the world, of course, jobs are the number one issue, or one of the number one issues. And fortunately, we've had some economic development, which has helped the job environment quite a bit. And and, and a lot of the folks that uh, really want to be working are able to work in uh, different parts of the district. Um, you also have the number one employer in many of the communities in our district is the government, quite candidly, whether it be the city government, the county government, or the school district is often the largest employer in the smaller communities. And so our job has always been to make sure that we have as strong a school districts as we can possibly have, that the um, we have strong uh, programs for the county and, and those types of things. And. Uh, Laredo, what's the boundary that you grab in Laredo? It's not all of Laredo. What's, no, what do you grab? It's not. It's, it's an, an interesting. And it's done by precinct lines, by voting sure. precinct lines, not county commissioner or JB precinct, precinct lines, but by voting precinct lines. And that's done every 10 years when we have redistricting, which is coming up after the next, we're going to do a census this year. I want to encourage everybody to participate in the census. I cannot tell you how valuable it is to South Texas if we get a good count. And, and everybody gets counted. Um, that's my sales pitch for the census there. But then after the census, we'll have redistricting, which is coming up in the next session of the legislature, where the boundaries are all redrawn. And that's where it's really, really important that you have experienced legislators there to help you and help the folks in your district make sure you get a fair boundary line. But 
answer your question here in Webb County, the um, the central and northern part and um, the Heights area, and the Chacon and the Santa Nino areas are represented by my colleague Richard Raymond, a good friend of mine. And then I represent everything outside the city limits. And then inside the city limits, I represent the south side of town from about um, uh, where the Sacred Heart Children's Home is, more or less, from that area south, um, Calle del Sur down there, and uh, from that area south, and then around on the east side of town, outside the city limits, the Cuatro Vientos area and that type of area. And then you come in on the north side, you have the San Isidro neighborhood and the Shiloh neighborhoods that are in the district, and then all of the area out there on Mines Road is in the district. So it works out to be about uh, one third of the city of Laredo is in the district. Everything outside the city limits is in the district. So, so it's, a, it's a good chunk. It is a big chunk and we spend a lot of time here in Laredo. In fact, is our district office is here in Laredo. And if somebody wants to go to a district office, what's that located at? It's at the Laredo South Campus, the mm -hmm. campus on the, which I'm very proud of that campus. I was in the legislature when we acquired the funding for that campus back in the day. And my good friend, Blas Castaneda, always reminds people that Tracy King was the guy that got the money for the South Campus. And it, I used to teach at the South Campus. Did you? And I used to teach for about four years at the South Campus. And uh, it's an interesting area. And it's, mm -hmm. I saw a lot of growth. I saw a lot of folks from not only South Laredo, but also from Zapata and, and the neighboring cities that, that maybe used to come down and actually go to school there. Yeah, speaking of Zapata, that's a great part of the district too. Really, really fine people there that have been very, very accepting of me. And I enjoy uh, visiting the folks and working in Zapata. There's six counties in the district. It's um, uh, Webb County, Zapata County, uh, Demet County, Frio County, Zavala County, and Wabalde County on the north end. It kind of, it's a district that runs north and south. Muscle Mammoths right up Highway 83 other than Frio County. La Salle is not your district. No, it's not. I used to represent Saw County in the previous configuration, and um, I miss them. I, I thought, you know, I was hoping we'd get to keep the Saw County, but uh, my friend Ryan Guillen, who used to represent part of Webb County, County. Mm -hmm. he represents the Saw County now. And he's a he's a great man. Mm -hmm. he, he is. You know, he's he, he's done great. What what do we have coming up in the near in the near future that we can say in Texas that we need to look out for? and folks need to start paying attention closely. Well, and the, of course, redistricting is coming up in the next session of the legislature. We also are, um, the oil fields slowed down quite a bit, and uh, a large portion of the state funding comes from excise taxes, off oil and gas. And so uh, we're expecting the next session of the legislature is going to be a tight budget year. We were fortunate last time in this last budget session we had we had money to spend and that was good a lot of our areas were able to benefit tremendously from that uh, the school has got a uh, modest increase the teachers some of them got a modest increase the retired teachers um, got what we call a 13 check and they're all very very happy right now with with that aspect of it with and a number of transportation projects did really, really well here. We were able to um, get a lot of money for transportation projects here in Webb County and Zapata County and some of the other parts of the district. But the next session, because of the slowdown in the oil field, the prognosticators are telling us that it's going to be a tough budget session. So we're going to be fighting for money. What do you foresee is going to be the toughest one? Well, we're going to, there's a couple of areas that we're going to need. First of all, <clears throat> The state employees that work for the state of Texas, some three or four hundred thousand of them, didn't get any pay increases in the last session of the legislature that were drafted in there. And the money was uh, used in public education in that area. So they're overdue a pay raise. So we're going to work very, very hard to help the state employees in the next session of the legislature. In fact, I wrote a letter independently to the Legislative Budget Board, which has some authority to shift money during the interim when the legislature is not in session, and ask them to do everything they could to try and shift some money to give some employee pay raises to state employees during the interim. And um, so I sent that letter here a while back, asking them to do that. The um, so we're going to work on that. You also have the 
ERS, which is the Employee Retirement Program, which is a state employee retirement program. And retirement programs are required to be actuarially sound for 31 years. That means that they have got enough money on hand to pay their obligations for the next 31 years. And that makes them actuarially sound for 31 years. And that is a constitutional requirement. And a lot of times they'll be a little less or a little more than that. In a lot of states, in most states, the programs are, are only actuarially sound for 12 or 15 years. But it doesn't mean that they're going to go broke, it just means they're going to have to put a bunch of money in it. The employee retirement system right now is actuarially sound, that they're telling us now, um, you know, for 25 years or so. And so, on paper, there again, it doesn't mean it's going to grow broke. It's one of the soundest programs in the United States. And because the state of Texas is a conservative state from a fiscal standpoint. But we're going to need to put some money in that program. Well, we certainly don't want to get it from the employees. So the state of Texas is going to need to shift some money over into the employee retirement system. And I'm, I'm all for that, making it actually sound. One thing a lot of people don't know about Texas is, is very unique. Our state constitution requires us to balance our budget every two years. At the first week in the session when I get back in Austin in 2021, the uh, comptroller is going to give us some an estimate of the two-year revenue stream for the two years coming out. And that's all the money you can spend in the state of Texas. And you cannot pass a budget that exceeds the amount that the comptroller tells you you're going to bring in. So that's very, very different than most states and certainly different than our federal government. You know, they, they print money up there. Absolutely. And uh, with that being said, a lot, of, a lot of counties, the census is very, it's necessary for that. Oh, absolutely. Because... A lot of counties and cities, there's a lot of programs that are based upon population brackets. And so at 50,000, at 100,000, there's numbers where those, those funding mechanisms kick in. And so you will see the cities and the counties pushing for, I pray, that they push hard to get everybody counting. Um, we're very concerned about it because right now some of the sentiment at the national level is um, quite candidly, Paul, unfortunately, it's making people afraid to be counting. And uh, that's a tragedy, and uh, no citizen should be afraid to be counted. And I, I would encourage everybody to participate in the census. But unfortunately, some of the national politics is is uh, pretty ugly right now. And it's and it's uh, you're yeah, you're absolutely correct because you know there's a lot of people that are being scared. You know they don't want to put down there that their grandmother lives here or their great aunt or their aunt or what have you. You know, and uh, that's something that needs to change, and that needs to change dramatically because we have a lot of great citizens here. Yeah, we want to count everybody, whether they're a young, old, um, foreign-born, or whether, candidly, whether they're documented or undocumented. We want to make sure that everybody is counting because they all count in terms of trying to pull down funds from the state and federal government for our area. And we desperately need that. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, here we sit, you know, Laredo sits in kind of in, in a special entity. Kind of people say Laredo's its own little island. And... Uh, because here in Laredo, you have a lot of families that have families on both sides. Of the yes, sir. they do. And that's very, that's, you know, it's very harsh, you know, so there's a lot of feelings going around. There's a lot of people need to understand where, where we're at, and there's a lot of businesses that are on both sides of the border as well, you know, and with this um, type of rhetoric that's going on, there's a lot of animosity, and you start seeing it even in, inside some of these businesses. And they kind of start becoming very recluse, and they stop either mm -hmm. doing business or so it's going to hurt us in the long, in the long run. I believe. It will. Yeah. No, it's, it's not. So it's not good for us at all. So I think we should start right now changing to better ourselves because mm -hmm. this, if the way we continue, it's going to we're going to end up in a hole. Well, yeah, and you just you just don't want to divide people. You want to unite people. Absolutely. And I've always been a big believer that in this district, I always unite people, irregardless of their their situation in life, where they work. Uh, their ethnicity or their language. Uh, I've always been someone that believed that everybody had an opportunity and we need to unite people and we need to uh, work for programs and progress based on what works for everybody as a whole. Absolutely. Absolutely. What else do you foresee? What else do you see, think that's going to be a major, major change or ma major point of view that we really need to start focusing on? Well, the... Um, Certainly in, in South Texas, we need to always work towards um, 
better access towards technology. You know, when when I got here, you were uploading some stuff and waiting on that, and that's a huge issue now. It wasn't an issue 20 years ago, or even as much 10 years ago, but now it is. And so, and the broadband that is delivered to our communities is delivered by private companies. And of course, they're trying to make money, so they're picking and choosing where they want to put their resources. And it requires a lot of resources in order to deliver truly high-speed internet, what we consider high-speed by today's standards. Stage. And so we have to, a lot of times, um, use the tools that are at our disposal in state government to encourage those companies to deliver broadband not only to the cities where, the, where there's a high capacity of users, but also to the rural areas. Uh, because the rural areas are always struggling in order for more jobs and more opportunities for their children. And then if you shortchange them on the high-speed internet and broadband type issues, it just exaggerates that for them. And so we're always working towards making sure that broadband is more broadly available. Candidly, with the oil field coming in, you know, you had a lot of those people pushing for broadband. So we had a good ally there when the oil field was really, really active because they were an ally in helping to push the broadband providers to give us better access. Yeah, absolutely. You had a lot of workers out in the field in rural areas that needed to get in touch base with... They wanted to report. You know, they go check a well. They're expected to download that report right then. And so when Shell Oil, for example, just as an example, says, well, wait a minute, you know, south of Katarina, we don't have very good access. And so this isn't going to work. And so they start putting pressure also on the, whoever the providers are in that area, and that helps, that helped us a lot. But there's still always more to do in order to keep up. Moving forward, and do you, you uh, oil's always been a big, big business here in Texas. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's gonna start growing back again in the near future? Well, a number of years ago, they had reports out called Peak Oil, which predicted that we was going to run out of oil in the state and United in the world in a certain period of time. It was it was going to be coming up pretty quickly, and then you had hydraulic fracturing, and you had the the shale that's all over the country now, but particularly here in Texas. And all of a sudden, we have an oversupply, and uh, the United States becomes one of the largest oil producers in the world. So it's hard to predict those things because sometimes technology and, and men's ingenuity will surprise you. But right now, oil is trading in the mid-50s and, and for West Texas Intermediate. And so it's a huge issue to the state of Texas. You better believe the comptroller of the state of Texas can tell you every single day what West Texas Intermediate sells for. And I wish I knew what the oil markets were going to do. I, I really don't know. I just know that that uh, it's a supply and demand issue completely. Absolutely, absolutely. I think things are going to change, and uh, hopefully we continue with that because you have a lot of, a lot of those companies employ mm -hmm. a lot of workers, and that's what we need, especially in this area. Right, right. And here you also see a lot of transportation. You you have a lot of import export. Are we going to be getting moving moving along with new roads and so on and so forth? Is that what you're looking forward to? Because I've heard a lot of talk about a new spur connecting, I think, uh, the south, or the valley, to 35. Well, there's there's some big projects in the works like that. And then right here in Webb County, we've got, you know, I represent the Mines Road area, and I have off and on for 20 years. And uh, the population, that area, those roads weren't built for the kind of populations out there now. They didn't anticipate that. It's an uh, industrial area like that, so it's very, very, even if you wanted to expand the road, you've got industrial warehouses that, that you need to relocate somewhere. So it becomes a challenge, but we have been working with the state to try and there's several projects that are gonna allow people to access Interstate 35 from the Mines Road area without having to come down 1472. And that's gonna help. And then um, on the loop, there's several, loop 20, there's several places there where the state is pumping money into that area. It's interesting, you know, people, it never happens fast enough, but it, the amount of money that the state of Texas spends on transportation issues alone, and I have those numbers, I've been accumulating those numbers just 
that I'm going to share with the folks as the campaign goes on. We've got some pretty significant numbers uh, in terms of the amount of funding that has been spent in this area from different agencies in the state of Texas that, that quite candidly, uh, that myself, Richard Raymond, and Senator Zafferini have been working on very, very hard for a long time. So when people say, well, we hadn't got this and we hadn't got that, we're going, well, we're fixing to show you what we've got. And that'll be coming out later on. So I'm, we're excited about that, but it's enormous amounts of money from different programs, from all the different agencies. Absolutely. And I think everybody needs to, especially before it's on the mine road, I think mm -hmm. uh, Laredo, the city of Laredo, Webb County, and the state, you know, they need to really focus on that area. Well, the same thing in the South. Uh, the South, oh, the South we're, we're working on, you know, the Cuatro Vientos was a huge yeah, issue absolutely. that came in absolutely. there. And as time goes on, we're going to increase in the demand. Get, we're going to increase the access on and off of that particular uh, stretch of highway right there and the way it sinks in with Loop 20 and those types of things. But but they all come with, uh, with the time. Of course, we're competing with, for money, we compete with uh, the... The Dallas, San Antonio, Houston Triangle in that area, which is where all of the population growth is for the most part. You know, the population growth in Texas is in that triangle and along the border, Laredo and South, and that's where it all is pretty much. And so you have to compete with them for a limited amount of funds. And um, the gas tax hadn't changed, and that's where we pay for highways. We pay for highways with the gasoline tax, which hadn't changed in many, many, many years. And we pay for highways with, uh, we, we supplement that with sales tax revenues, which increases as the sales in the state of Texas goes up. And then we also supplement it with oil and gas excise taxes. And that's where, and then the federal government throws in a little money also on federal funds for, for that type of thing. But, so, so what we do, go ahead, Paul. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. So the way this works in the legislature is um, a lot of times, uh, about the middle of next year, the middle of this year, excuse me, it's 2020. 2020. Um, and we've already started compiling a folder. I've already gotten requests from people, and I do throughout the year, and it seems to speed up as we get closer to the end of the year, but we get requests from constituents that have ideas about pieces of legislation. You know, there'll be 6,000 pieces of legislation filed in the next, in the first two months of of next year and the vast majority of that legislation comes from people that we represent and so I'll have a folder of what I call potential legislative topics in the next session of the legislature that we would have compiled during the last few years and there's already several things in there that we're looking at and studying and that we're going to consider possibly and some of them are um, kind of some of them are, are a bit of a reach uh, I'll just say that, you know, they're, they're sort of pie in the sky kind of things. And some of them, people bring to you and you go, you know, it's interesting that in the hundreds of years of the state of Texas, nobody ever thought of that. That's a great idea. And they come from people like the people that are watching this podcast. And so we're going to be getting a lot more of those here in the next few months. We compile that. And then, uh, I know I heard Judge T. Hedino make the comment the other day when he introduced me that, that, um, I've been good for them on their legislative program, but the counties and the cities, city of Laredo and, and Webb County are both very, very active. They have legislative committees and they'll bring us a, a slate of legislation that they think needs to be worked on in the next legislative session and we work on those for them. That's where it comes from. Absolutely. And you are the ones who represent us. So that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's grassroots driven like that. That's the way it should be done. Mm -hmm. Well, early vote is coming up in the next Three February weeks, 18th. Yeah, three mm -hmm. weeks, more or less. Mm -hmm. And uh, your office, where can they get a hold of you if they need, need to get a hold of you? Well, we're very, very accessible. And um, by email, text messaging, phone, um, social media platforms. But we maintain uh, an office here in Laredo, in South Laredo at LC campus. And uh, then we maintain and office at the state capitol has been there all the time. And then I have an office also that I use in Wildy where people can get hold of me at either one of those two places. And um, it's on the internet, on our, on our website that we have for the Texas House of Representatives. 
Thank you, absolutely. And I want to thank you for sharing your uh, your views and what's coming up and what we should look forward to and onward with the campaign and wishing you the best of luck. And uh, well, well, thank you, Paul. We look forward to to represent the district for another two years. Look forward to any interaction with the people. And I would encourage anybody that has any questions to contact us if they want to know how we feel about certain issues to let us know. And I look forward to the opportunity to discuss any of the issues with any of the other candidates that um, are out there. Sure. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll look into having a debate and we'll have one. Yeah, good. I look forward to it. We'll look forward to it. And again, be safe driving back. Folks out there, you all take care and have a it's wet out there and be careful. All right, until next time. Peace. Following political paid advertisements do not reflect the political opinions of the program or its associates. Any political campaign or candidate who wishes to purchase advertising can do so. Advertising is open to all on behalf of Gloves Off. community affairs, and the happenings around us. This segment of Gloves Off is brought to you by the best, so pay them a visit, check them out. This is Gloves Off. Ha, ha, ha.